Hello fans of Acid Horizon, this is Craig. One thing that you can do to show your appreciation for the podcast is log on to any of the platforms where you listen to this podcast, namely Apple Podcasts or anywhere else for that matter, and give us a five-star review and leave us a nuanced comment. One of the things that we like to hear is episodes that you particularly enjoyed, or there's also a place where you can make suggestions to us if you're not connected to us anywhere else on social media, for example. If you're listening on YouTube, click like and subscribe, navigate to the show notes, check out the Patreon account, check out the merch, check out the blogs, you know the deal. Anyway, today we are talking about cybernetics with one of our patrons. Uh, His name is Nick, so let's hop right in. Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. This is our second official installment of our 2023 series entitled The Lost Cyber Highway. Once a month or so, we will feature an episode on the topic of cybernetics, the control society, and related topics. That said, we wanted to create a bit of a foundation for this ongoing discussion by taking a look at some concepts in the research area known as cybernetics. Today's episode will be a bit of a primer on the topic as we explore an important paper from the early years of the 21st century entitled Cybernetics and Second Order Cybernetics by Haylion and Jocelyn. Today with us on the show, we have a longtime patron and friend of the podcast, Nick. Nick has been in our reading groups as an active member and an active member on our Discord server. And in the course of getting to know him, it has been revealed to us that he is a cybernetics aficionado. And he will be an incredible asset to our discussion here today. And before we begin, wherever you're listening, please click like, subscribe. You know the deal. Nick, welcome to the show today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. First things first, let's just give an introduction to you and your relationship with the topic of cybernetics. How did you get into this? And like, what is your specific research interest when it comes to cybernetics? Sure. So I studied at, I studied philosophy as an undergraduate and shortly after graduating went to work in the software industry. So I, I'm not a programmer, as, as I said, I was a philosopher, and, but working in here and working with people who build and operate digital infrastructure for a living, working with computers all day. I, of course, I work with them myself, but they're actually like programming them. And selling to working with the accounts that I was working with, other programmers and other other software engineers, got me very interested in digital technology, distributed digital infrastructure, and how people work to build and maintain this infrastructure. And as part of my work, I stumbled upon some literature actually coming out of research, in, contemporary research in safety, in the fields of safety, and thinking about digital infrastructure as important to various things that we rely upon to keep ourselves safe and to, to provide meaningful services like air traffic controllers who are working incre- increasingly with digital technologies or medical health records, folks that are building those sorts of technologies. And so as a part of delving into that literature, they draw upon literature around cybernetics, around complexity theory, complex systems, complex dynamical systems. And so I took that and decided to pursue a master's where I was researching complexity, the history of complexity as it relates to cybernetics, and then trying to think about how someone who's doing social research and philosophy can bring that to bear to support people who are doing this important work in trying to keep us all safe. So that's what I'm doing now professionally. Great. So over the past year or so, Adam and I and Will have all been looking at philosophical works on cybernetics. I mean, uh, of course, there might be a limited threshold in comparison to what's out there scientifically and mathematically. You presented us with this paper, Cybernetics and Second Order Cybernetics, which is a fantastic paper. We'll link it in the show notes because what it does is, I mean, first off, it provides a glossary of terms. It elucidates core concepts. There is a bit of 
industry math, I guess you could say. It shouldn't provide too much of a stumbling block, but what you do get also is some of the core concepts that we will probably be using again and again as we develop this series and connect it to our own research. As well, we get several of the figures who are popular in in the field of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, Stafford Beer, and many others. And so, Nick, before we kick off, Maybe you could give us a little bit of that history that they that they just outline a bit at the beginning of this paper, at least as you understand it. Sure. So cybernetics as its own distinct discipline sort of comes about early World War II, around right around that period, as folks in the US government especially are trying to figure out how to develop weapons of war and to make them effective. So think of here about anti-aircraft guns is a classic one. Norbert Wiener and several other mathematicians, especially from the East Coast, Harvard, Boston area, were hired by the government to try to figure out and how to help computers who were then women performing calculations, typically women perform calculations, how to do that faster, better, so that these guns could shoot down enemy planes for example. And so they're really bringing this idea of how do we calculate the firing of the gun, of the weapon? How does that feedback from the gun, the reverberation from its firing, affect itself? How does it auto-target and correct for that feedback such that it can keep tracking the plane as it's trying to shoot it down? So that's a that's a classic example of, early, of an early cybernetics problem that they're trying to do. And from this research and working with various folks in the DOD, other mathematicians like John von Neumann, you get all kinds of early cyberneticians who I'm not going to list off here, get involved in the mathematics and, and in this calculation, especially bringing to bear Claude Shannon and Weaver's theory of information, which was also developed out of Bell Labs coming out of World War II and trying to think about information code cracking from Nazi communication and thinking about how to effectively do that and mathematize and quantify a formal quantified theory of communication so you could think about cracking these codes. All this sort of comes together, is supported by the DOD and its post-World War II rollout through the 20th century, leads to the rise of IBM, leads to research areas in artificial intelligence. You get anthropologists, like Margaret Mead, for example, who are participating in various conferences and in dialogue with this, you start getting this even into philosophy. I mean, Donald Davidson with his rational choice theory and philosophy of mind is very important here. A lot of that sort of stuff, cybernetics feeds into various parts of academia. It's crucial to the rise of cognitive psychology as an academic discipline, for example. So that's sort of the origins of cybernetics as its own discipline. A lot of the probabilistic thinking that it works with, the statistics, has earlier roots, but I'll, I'll leave that aside for now. Sure. And and before I get others in on the discussion, I know Adam, for example, has a, has a breadth of questions. I'll just ask one more thing to get us oriented. The name of this paper is Cybernetics and Second Order Cybernetics. Could you flesh out that distinction a bit? What do those terms mean? Sure. So the original idea of cybernetics is trying to think about a system, whatever a system, however you define a system, and its goal-orientedness and how it understands the world and how it, it as a sort of model is the, is the technical term of the world and controlling itself and updating its model such that it tries to achieve its goal. Again, think of the gun trying to shoot out shoot the plane out of the sky. And then second order cybernetics try is a blurry, but think of it as a second generation, a meta discourse that is building upon the first order, first, first iteration of cybernetics, thinking about with living systems in particular, they create models of their own models. There's a recursive aspect here of thinking about their own thinking, and thinking about their own goals and, and trying to understand themselves as they're pursuing goals. And so the way that that affects the creation of the model and how it modifies the model, the first order modeling process. Again, it's sort of blurry, as they say in the paper, folks who were involved in the first order, first iteration of cybernetics were continued to be involved over the course of their careers in this second order cybernetics. But there is, if you're playing fast and loose, you can say there's a first generation, a second generation second generation building upon the first generation in a recursive process. 
I really like the focus on the militarization aspect in early cybernetics that he's bringing up, Nick, especially as well thinking about how it relates to your own work. So you're talking about air traffic control, and th- this is the some of the purest examples of of cyber nation in action, really. I mean, thinking about the sort of paradigm shift that's made through cybernetics, particularly around the idea of air, is you know thinking about objects that move through the air as planes, they're not moving in fixed patterns necessarily, especially if you think about enemy planes. They are the, the system is is open actually. And one of the paper, other papers you sent, which we'll link down below, a uh, complexity and philosophy, really gets this idea that cybernetics is a scientific response to the sort of the exhaustion of Newtonian mechanics. Or not simply the not simply to get rid of it or replace it, but to extend it, because Typically, you know, the mechanical view of shooting down the enemy is the enemy is moving towards you to attack you. You shoot it, it dies. Sorry, they die. You know, well, whatever. You know, it, there's a destruction there. There's negation. It's a simple like, linear chain. Whereas what the plane brings into it, because it can move out in so many extra dimensions in, in order to attack you, the the, mechan- you know, the mechanical intervention of shooting them or destroying them isn't really the main problem now. The, you, you can shoot them. We have you know, we have the technology to shoot them. We just have the technology to know where they are. Yeah, Vina's evasion was the, was the idea of a, a predictor to come in because, and I think this is really a, a great way of explaining something like Gregory Batterson's definition of information, which is good. You don't have to get too much into the mathematics of it, which isn't my strong suit. Which is you know, the, he says it, and I think the essay. The cybernetics of the self, which is in towards an ecology of mind, which is an information is a difference that makes a difference. Mm-hmm. The pro- the question is, okay, we know how to destroy a plane, we just don't know where it's going to be to enact that mechanism. That mechanism. What are the differences that make a difference as to whether this intervention is going to be successful? And then, and this is where we get into the ideas of, of feedback. And I guess, I mean, how would one summarize feedback? I mean, there's I guess to get summarized feedback, we'd have to go back to the original definition of cybernetics, going back to the Greek kybernetes, which is the root for piloting or steering. And of course, we the similar, the equivalent word in Latin gives us the word for governance, governments as well, governments, governance. So there's a question about so how would we break down these ideas of gathering information in a cybernetic manner, particularly along these axes of feedback, and also this interesting concept which I've only recently heard about due to this paper, which is which is feed forwards. How does information become, rather than simply mechanistic, but dynamic under a cybernetic understanding of it in terms of feeding back and, and feeding forward? Sure. So Claude Shannon, in his conception of information is quant- quanta quantified technical theory of information aligns it with Boltzmann's concept of entropy. And Boltzmann's concept of entropy is the idea coming out of, and here I'm going to draw a lot on Ilya Prigine and Isabel Stenger's work, Order Out of Chaos, to, to sort of explain this. So it's coming out of the a disparate dimension of physics from the Newtonian paradigm. And this is thermal. This is thermal. This is the study of heat. And when you've got a hot body put into contact with a relatively cooler body, the energy from the hotter body will flow into the cooler body such that the temperature becomes normalized. Everything becomes, there'll be eventually an equilibrium throughout the, this new system that has been constituted by that, by that relation. And the process of moving towards that now steady state from what was what Gilbert Samandan would call a metastable state to a, and the energy flowing, the potential energy flowing from this hotter part of the system to, to the colder part is the growth of entropy. And what entropy here is, is the possibility, so a matrix of possible states that any part of the system can be in becoming equiprobable. So increasing energy, equal probability. And you want to think about the chances of that increasing. So equiprobability becomes more and more likely over time. So as the energy is flowing from the high pressure, high energy to low, 
low, those particular states throughout the the state the the state space are what Boltzmann originally called complexions, and in which in this paper they call bits. And these are possible combinations of all the different dimensions that or the values of uh, values of all the different relevant dimensions for the state space. And the fact or the the chance that any of those will be realized or actualized to properly to use the properly philosophical term becomes equiprobable. I want to make sure that I'm actually answering your question, Adam. Could you make sure could you repeat it just to make sure I get it? So the question was just it how how does cybernetics treat insofar as cybernetics is a shift of treating the problem of, of understanding you know, how to interact with a body as being one of information rather than purely intervention insofar as they know how to intervene. It's just about predicting where things are going to go. How does cybernetics kind of treat information dynamically? And particularly, how does it treat information in regards to these you know, the central notions of feedback and, feed, and you know, going on from that feeding forward? And it was more general, I guess, it's basically, basically sort of how does, how does feedback and feedforward work in a cybernetic system insofar as it's treating information as a central, a central problem? What a cybernetic system is trying to do is to achieve a goal. That's the point of the governance. It's trying to steer itself to a particular place, and mm-hmm. it needs to, therefore, be in relation to that goal, that other thing. And it needs to have some sense of where it is relative to itself in a broader environment. And so it needs to be informed about where that target, where that goal is and what it's doing. And it needs to be able to understand itself, inform itself both of that thing and also inform itself of its relation to everything else around it such that it can steer towards it. And so this is a way in which a cybernetic system has to, one might say, overhear itself. It informs itself about itself relative to the goal that it's trying to achieve. And so this is the recursive feedback that comes in to make sure that the the system is steering itself towards the goal that it is in relation towards. Yeah, I mean, I have a more basic question. So. Like when I see cybernetic feedback loops, whether they're articulations of attempts at the construction of a basic first order cybernetic construction or of an attempt to kind of a sort of second order cybernetics, I can't help but see, you know, Francois Quinet's economic table from the, you know, from the, the 18th century. And I'm wondering, is there is there a connection at all historically? And this is a and if if you don't know, it doesn't matter. Is there a connection at all historically between developments in economic theory in the 18th century and the development of cybernetics as a science? Because especially as we start seeing, you know, the the rise of new technologies of intervention and non-intervention when it comes to the prevention of famine in Europe and things like that, there seems to be a very similar, there seems to be a very similar outlook as it pertains to the question of like, what does it mean to establish a, and to establish an entity as an autonomous system, right? Epistemically. And what does it mean to intervene and not intervene in that system or that ecosystem? Because that seems to have been the question of, the physiocrats as it pertained to like grain prices, right? Here it's something, you know, a little different, right? But they they seem to share a kind of, at the most like basic level, they the pictures look the same, right? <laughs> like So like the economic table looks a lot like your basic, you know, cybernetic chart. So I'm wondering if there's a, a connection between the history of economics and the history of cybernetics. So I don't, know super well the connection between this, but I will say that there's something that rhymes that perhaps will, you know, merits further investigation, which is actually looking at Foucault's lectures on the birth of biopolitics. In, I believe it's the 11th lecture, 
he it, he describes how Hume and Adam Smith have this sort of thought experiment. I think it's really Hume, where you discover some guy doing something, like maybe he's exercising, and you ask him, why are you exercising? Well, because I don't want to get sick. Why don't you want to get sick? Well, because that would hurt and I wouldn't be able to do whatever. And well, why do you want to do this thing? Or why do you believe that you're going to get sick? And eventually it traces, the point of this is that it eventually traces back to an individual with a matrix of beliefs and desires Mm. that are constituted. And this is the individual with who can operate to maximize their utility based on their beliefs and desires. We see this picked up again in 20th century philosophy with rational choice theory, for example, that is the basis, this individual is the, with their matrix of beliefs and desires, is the basis that Adam Smith works with in developing his theory of capitalism. Someone trying to maximize the utility. And this this, uti- this utility maximizing individual with a matrix, again, of beliefs and desires is at the heart of capitalist economics. Yeah, I think that that's really helpful precisely because what, what Foucault will say in The Birth of Biopolitics is that in the post-physiocratic liberal order, the the shift is is no longer a question of like the sovereign individual and their rationality but building an art of government that pertains to the ration, specifically the rational behavior of the individual who is being governed so the, the the question of course seems to seems to be based on a modeling of of actors and and, a, and an establishing of a, of a field of interests and then if you understand the actor in the interests then I'm assuming the the assumption is that interventions are more effective. But I I also think that part of the the question as it pertains to to cybernetics is that it allowed for an understanding of not just like interests and desires, but a reorientation around like capacities and abilities. Right, because Foucault will focus on the work of Gary Becker, who who introduces the notion of human capital into neoliberal discourse in the mid '60s, and of course this <laughs> this at the time was like these economic disputes were largely missed by by Marxist economists and Marxist political theorists, and it is very much an attempt to try to respond to to Marxian political theory and and the Marxian critique of political economy. And I'm wondering if we see not just a reorientation of of how we understand systems or ecosystems, but as such, if it also forces a a shift in how we understand like the individual actor. Like once the once the the milieu is changed, right, everything that exists within it necessarily goes through an incorporeal transformation as well. And I'm wondering if if maybe the question is not. And this, of course, like Foucault already did. <laughs> but if the question is not, what's the relationship between cratic liberalism and cybernetics, but probably what's the relationship between neoliberalism and cybernetics? But yeah, that's just food for thought, I guess. But uh, yeah, I, I think I was, I was leaning towards asking a question that pertains to security, territory, and population. But it seems that the answer is actually a year later for Foucault with the birth of biopolitics. So there's going to be many sort of things we could talk about for the history of economics and history of management of general that we can say maps onto the 20th century field of, of cybernetics. I mean, to give an example of a positive and negative feedback loop you can sort of read in is Malthus. His essay on the principle of population is that there's like a tendency in the system, you know, the system of humans interact of human populations interacting with nature around them to move away from a stable equilibrium in which they can sort of basically feed them, they have enough to feed themselves and their kids. The positive feedback loop is actually more humans make more humans who eat more, who eat more, who eat more. Of course, Malthus didn't think of, you know, technology or any sort of actual abundance because he was a just, you know, he was trying to justify some horrible things here. But and in Malthusian argument, 
a positive feedback loop knocks the system out of equilibrium, and then the population system is brought back into equilibrium by a negative feedback loop, which is negative. And so it feeds back insofar as it has to wait for the, the disruption system to happen. And it's negative in that it brings away the ability of the system to spiral control by reducing the population. And this is you know, famine, is a Malthusian negative feedback loop. And this sort of justification is is exactly what the British were doing and to not intervene in the genocide that they were conducting in, in Ireland. Because it, it wasn't a famine, it was just they weren't selling people food because they thought, well, if we sell you food, there'll be more of you. And therefore, you know, this positive feedback loop will never end. And, you know, so one can read them as, as cyberneticians, but I think there's a more interesting question rather than saying this is cybernetics and therefore cybernetics is this, is that, one of the key notions, I think, which can help us understand these like, questions of, you know, is there a link between this and this, is there's two, there's two phrases that come to mind here for me. One, you have for, for Deleuze and Guattari, the idea of an abstract machine. But to put it in more cybernetic language, at least in terms of cyberneticians, there's the notion of isomorphism. And so I had a question, could you uh, explain sort of how isomorphism works in cybernetic terms, particularly how it is cybernetics can be so in, inherently sort of interdisciplinary. You can, yeah, you said anthropologists like Margaret Mead and of course Gregory Batterson, who's also doing psychology. We have neuro, you know, we have neuro theorists. We have John von Neumann making computers. You know, how does isomorphism work in the cybernetic understanding? And how does that allow them to create ideas of systems which are abstract, but nonetheless are incredibly concrete in terms of the systems of relations they describe, I guess. You know, how does one take the idea of a system as such and say, all right, cybernetic, and then move to the idea of a general systems theory, a system of systems? Sure. So cybernetics is, and this is something that Gilbert Simondo and really credits Norbert Wiener and, and all the rest of them for, is the first scientific discipline or attempt at a scientific discipline that doesn't focus on established structure. So you could think of the astronomy as the study of planetary bodies, celestial bodies. You could think of physics, especially Newtonian in the Newtonian paradigm, as the study of individual atoms bouncing into each other. It's a simplification, but for the sake of argument. And what cybernetics does is it tries to abstract from any particular structure and to look at the operations between structure. And so this is the way in which it is the first science to focus on really how things affect each other rather than just what they are as in and of themselves. So that, that I think would be what he credits them for but thinks that they he ultimately critiques them, critiques them for not fulfilling. I was just going to finish by saying, and this is where we get the lovely phrase from the cybernetics Stafford Beer, the meaning of a system is what it does. It's all functions all the way down. And this is where you get into Lars Guattari when they're talking about language, and we'll get to this in a wrap-up episode later on on the, on the positive linguistics, when they're saying that language, what it means is separate from what it does, or what it does is more fundamental to that. They are taking fundamentally a cyberness's view of language. Every, when they say machinic, they mean functional, they mean active, and they mean you can make abstract diagrams machines that move the, you know, move the things that go through them in the same way that any other machine does. How an anthropologist can talk about an abstract machine of a kinship group or society in the same way that so neuropsychology, neuropsychology might talk about the brain, and, and they might talk about computers as brains. This is the, the lovely translatability of cybernetics, which I think is part of its interdisciplinary nature, of course, as you said, and inherently it's, it's appeal. So, well, sorry. Yeah, I, I wonder, though, interestingly, too, where cybernetics, well, cyberneticians, particular cyberneticians, and even to a certain extent, that assertion about Simone Doan, like I'm reminded of, of Reiner Sherman's, you know, necessity to revive that old that old Heidegger quote at the end of his life where he's and Agamben will sometimes say oh some guy said the decisive question is this one about technology that's Heidegger it's hiding it Heidegger said it but uh, I'm wondering when it says oh the, the cybernetics is just what these things do the, the, there's a there's a sort of strange 
attempt to smuggle in a kind of nihilist realism in the place of what we say, oh, this was the RK of that system. And that's the false. What, what cybernetics brings is the bare real of systematicity. And I can't help but be mildly, con- well, obviously concerned, but mildly critical of the, of the strange, of the strange assertion that through, and of course, Ryan, Reiner Sherman doesn't escape this, right? Like he ends up with a relational ontology as well, that, that through relation, we can find like the, the, the unobstructed real. And I wonder, you know, is, are there, I'm assuming there are, but what are some responses that, that I guess the answer would be ecology, right? Like, isn't, isn't philosophical ecology kind of this, this ontology of relation flipped to, you know, contemporary issues of like post Deleuze and Guattari ontology? I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I worry that in a certain sense, this, this doesn't, this just posits a new a new fundamental structure, but it's just one that that is instead po- trying to posit itself as a kind of of a, a nihilism or an end of ontology or something like that. How much of this stuff impacted technological developments in computer science in the '60s? Because a lot of this was speculative in the '40s and '50s, and now some of it seems sort of obvious to the point where like media figures like Elon Musk are quite far from from being on the knife's edge of technological development <laughs> invoke Norbert Weiner and and folks like that. So uh, do can you can you speak to the relationship between computation as a sort of analogical development in whether it's governmental history or technological consumer technology whatever and cybernetics? Absolutely. I mean, so my reference here, my go-to reference here, is a book by Paul Edwards called The Closed World, where he really lays out a history of cybernetics, its development through the 20th century up to the 90s after the, the fall of the USSR. And really cybernetics and the need to invest in computers and to continue to invest in this comes out of the fear of the Soviet Union, the rise of, of communism and the need by the U.S. both to enclose that, to keep it contained, to protect and enclose the capitalist world system that that the U.S. wants to protect the liberal world order. And then, of course, the bomb, which was developed in World War II, which sort of set an upper limit on the amount of destruction that we can perform, like it is the ultimate weapon, and sort of provides a bounding of the world as a world system in which these two discrete forces, the the liberal world order that the U.S. is is championing and is constituting at this time, and the USSR and its sort of world order that it's uh, framed as composing in opposition to, to the capitalist one. And so a dichotomy is presented here that runs through the Cold War, the Defense Department's investments in building out computer technology so that they can build out anti-missile early warning detection systems and communicate with those military bases that that house these computer systems. There's a great example of this in the 70s where a number of false warnings and false almost almost retaliations, quote unquote, for folks who aren't watching the video, by the U.S. occur because there are problems with the computer system such that they get false alerts, basically. And so the U.S. almost launches a nuclear assault in in opposition to what is not actually being launched by the USSR. But, I mean, again, the rise of IB, IBM as a sort of spinoff from MIT and from these other research organizations, academic research organizations and military installations, the RAND Corporation and its war gaming that it does with the Vietnam War. You've got Project Igloo, which Edwards talks about quite a bit in the Vietnam War. And this idea of we're going to have a, a command and control mode of operation such that we can detect from sensors out in the Vietnam jungle when the Viet Cong are going down a particular road and we can automatically launch jets to go over and bomb the hell out of that route and, you know, disrupt the supply chain. And of course, the Viet Cong actually will totally confuse and mislead the sensors, as as one might imagine. They'll throw like 
I don't know, stuff down the road and that'll get them to launch. They'll, they'll launch the planes, bomb the place, and then just proceed down the path after, after they've gone home. So there's definitely major investments by the Department of Defense into computer technologies. The development of the von Neumann architecture, which is still the backbone of the, of the development of digital computers, was coming about at this time. So yeah, major, major involvement by cyber nutitions and investment by the military apparatus of the liberal world order during this period, time period. I wanted to ask a question about your extended reading of Deleuze and Guattari with us in the reading groups as it pertains to some of the work and some of the concepts that we see here in the paper that you had us read. And some of the concepts that I want to flag that are specifically cybernetic concepts are the terms attractor, entropy, and closure. And this idea of closure stood out to me specifically because I think it hits on some themes that we often encounter in our reading of Deleuze and Guattari. And I'll just read a very short bit of the paper. They say, cybernetics, on the other hand, studies closure explicitly with a view that systems may be open and closed simultaneously for different kinds of properties, F1 and F2. Such closures give systems an unambiguous identity. And that's in italics, explicitly distinguishing what is inside from what is outside the system. It goes on to say then, and this is what I thought was the interesting part, a more complex example of closure is this concept of autopoiesis, self-production, the process by which a system recursively produces its own network of physical components and thus continuously regenerating its essential organization in the face of wear and tear. Then they say, Note that such organizational closure is not the same as thermodynamic closure. The autopoietic system is open to the exchange of matter and energy with its environment, but it is autonomously responsible for the way these resources are organized. When I read that, my Deleuze and Gattari sensors are going crazy because, well, for a few reasons. One, it reminds me of the infamous highway example that, that's often brought up, the idea that desire is structured in such a way versus our intent, which is like when given a, a highway system, for example, if you live in Southern California, you have the 210, you have the 134, you have the five freeway. Those are all avenues by which you can express your libidinal desire by traveling down any one of them, getting off an exit, going to stores, homes, and whatnot, right? So inside of desire, you have expressions of intent. But what these authors here suggest in, in the cybernetics paper is that there's a kind of systemic closure with the creation of a highway system, although it is perforated in some sense, right? And it does allow for some variety, which the cybernetician would say in, in their language. But what interested me is this idea of autopoiesis, the creation of a kind of self-production within systems that seem already closed, maybe not so closed? Or how would one create an, a unit or a node of self-production inside of a system, for example, that was already closed? It seems the one thing that challenges the cyberneticist is the idea of closure because it seems that there is always an outside to closure. You have the system itself as it's identified, but then there's a sort of broader sphere of thermodynamics physics writ large. And so the question is, and I know that I'm, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here. Last week, we talked with Catherine Malibu about the idea of, of auto affection. And I don't know if you remember that, if you listen to that episode. And I think this is an important concept in Deleuze and Guattari when it comes to creating the new, creating new assemblages, because it seems that what's most important and what's at stake is, in some ways, separating from the functors in the system or the attractors and being able to lift out of it these intensities to create new formations, new political formations, new types of organization and what have you. I say all this only to say that, like, wow, I, I see an incredible overlap between terms and concepts here, you know, that makes, makes a, a sort of convergence of research not only possible, but 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 very lively. I, I was wondering to what extent that your reading of Deleuze and Qatari has fed back into your reading of cybernetics, and particularly in relation to this idea of autopoiesis and creating 
the kinds of, of rupture in a system, whether it's the capitalist system, whether it's a system of local politics or what have you, is there a way in which we can tie together these concepts and maybe in what ways, for example, does Deleuze and Guattari fall short in their, their understanding of cybernetics? In what ways does cybernetics buttress your understanding of Deleuze and Guattari? I, I present all of that to you to go on your own riff there. Sure. So actually, there's someone who has already explicitly talked about the relationship between Deleuze and Guattari and this concept of autopoiesis. And that's uh-huh. John Pordevi in his work, Life, War, Earth, which I highly recommend to folks. It's mm-hmm. been absolutely pivotal to my understanding of Deleuze and Guattari. And where, so let's make sure for, for the folks that are listening, autopoiesis is a concept that is very, very strongly associated with second order cybernetics. So it's a sort of meta, this meta cybernetics, if one will. So it is a thing is constituted and then is able to recursively affect itself such that it differs from that original constitution. Hmm. And this is very related to the idea of, from the postulates of linguistics plateau, where language does something. It, it, affects you, you can say something, and then you can overhear yourself saying that. And the fact of having overheard yourself saying that allows you to then refer to that state and go off on another tangent. Mm. So the fact that I just said all of that, I can now refer to it to produce a new statement, a novel, a novel statement. Mm-hmm. And this is an autopoetic concept in which it is the statement was produced, a sense was produced, as, as Deleuze would say from the logic of sense. That statement had an initial sense, and then that sense can be taken up. I can make another statement about that statement, so mm-hmm. in, in linguistics terms. So if there's a practical function to the, and an effect that is produced by making a statement, that can then be grasped or taken up and made use of again. And this sort of... Well, do you mind if I intervene there for a moment? I, I think that's you know phenomenally interesting because, I, I mean, some of what we're saying, I mean, it, of course, it's obvious to us that this is in the discourse of Deleuze and Gattari, but now hearing you repeat it back to me, it also reminds me of things like neuro-linguistic programming, CBT, therapy modalities where, you know, people will go before a therapist or something and they will construct affirmative statements. And I've been thinking about cybernetics in terms of psychotherapy and therapeutic modalities. Of course, there's so many different therapeutic modalities, but in the case of somebody doing something like neuro-linguistic programming or CBT or something like that, you're going to forge linguistic statements that in a moment of crisis, for example, you can refer back to, to rescue you from patterns that you establish that you're trying to get out of. I mean, that's just one set of simple strategies, but I, I, I'm curious if, if, if any of that sort of like, fall, you know, connects with what you have been thinking about with Deleuze and Guattari. Sure. I mean, a little bit of the way of thinking about what does it mean to assist others? Mm. What is it? What is an ethical practice for Deleuze and Watery? Mm-hmm. And as Pertevi will talk about, an ethical practice is attempting to amplify the positive affects, again, in a, in a sort of Spinoza sense. You want mm-hmm. to make people happy and you want to amplify that. And that is, that is an ethical thing to do. And when going to speak with a therapist, for example, what they are doing especially in like the the CBT example is they're providing a, they're helping you construct a relation with Mm -hmm. yourself or reconstruct or construct a new relation with yourself such that in this case with the positive affirmations, you can say something that statement informs you, which establishes a relation, which amplifies the process that is, that is ongoing, that is, that is going on. Uh, Mm -hmm. So they're informing you to help you inform yourself so that you can amplify your own joy, your own happiness in this case. And so by establishing that relation here, you can, we can think about in this case, what it means to 
ethically work with other people to form greater collectives in a way that is positively amplifying and hopefully not amplifying negative or inhibiting those positive affects and, and producing negative affects. Yeah. This is one of the things that I've concerned myself with recently in my writing too. I mean, one of the challenges of any therapy in a society that exists under capitalism, under domination, for example, is that, you know, no matter what happens in the space of therapy itself, you know, in the room with a counselor, everything there has to go back out into the world where all the other operators that are impacting that therapy do happen. So this is one of the challenges for establishing a kind of therapeutics that sees itself somehow as detached or removed from political work in the end. This is what Adam and I were talking about before we, we got going here today. I mean, one thing that really strikes me about the, the philosophy or to really the epistemology of cybernetics is how much it is, I mean, as he's pointing out, and in, indeed in some of the papers that you sent over, especially to think the one on complexity, it was talking about, yeah, the ethical impulse there. The idea that the cyberneticists were writing, well, contemporary cyberneticists are writing that these theories like Deleuze and Guattari and Derrida and Foucault were so useful for cybernetic thought because they also they affirm that there's a, a multiplicity of differences in the systems that we have. It's not like a simple enlightenment mechanism, you know, you do good things, good things like spiral out. Rather, the complexity of all the interlocking subsystems and societal machines ultimately make it a question that your, your choices really do matter because everything is so interconnected. And that's really where, where they think the differences come that make a difference. But in a way, it, it, philosophically, it does really seem very much like, like Kant as well. Because Kant is a guy who, because you know, the Kant's sort of main innovation in the theory of how we think about objects is, is that his ideas about what objects we can experience are not ideas which are constituted. They don't make their own objects. You know, uh, Kant's idea about God, God is like a regulative idea of our knowledge to tend towards the total of all possible knowledge, you know, the most real. Now, an argument for that principle as a regulative way of knowing things is not an argument that says there really is a God as an object out there. It's regulative and not constitutive. It is literally, you know, Kant always gives these metaphors of he's taking us on a journey from an island of good sense onto a sea of illusion. He's steering us around the illusions and then takes us back to the island. And therefore, we would know not to go out anymore because we've had the negative feedback. We've gone to the outside. It's communicated to us what we can't know. It's, you know, it's confused us. And then we've come back. And it really seems similar to the the epistemology of cybernetics that comes up in these papers, which is called they call it constructivism. And it's the idea that you know, when when one constructs a, a cybernetic view of the world, one is mapping out a model of a system of natural processes. So, for example, sweating. One one is mapping out the regulation of human body temperature by seeing how seeing how basically sweat you know, seeing how perspiration levels are in relation to body heat in relation to surrounding environmental temperatures or another good example the use of insulin pumps there's a cybernetic sensor which sends you know, detects blood sugar levels or and then applies insulin you know, in order to maintain a stable equilibrium and it just made me think of this idea from of constructivism as regarding putting a kind of a division between the ideas of the map and the territory, in a way that I wasn't actually quite expecting from a cybernetic. I, I I was I was too used to reading some of the early cyberneticists who were very positive that they can map out all these systems and everything can be regulated and quite clean. And this seems like a real disjunction between the first and the second order cyberneticists. I mean, in the first paper you sent us, it seems at one point Haley and Jocelyn actually seem to chastise the second order cyberneticists a little bit for let, running off with this idea that there's always going to be an irreducible kind of complexity or noise that they can't fully map out. So, sort of to turn this into a question, I mean, what do you think the sort of philosophical implications of, of cybernetics is in terms of how it looks at the world? Is there an innate tendency of cybernetics to sort of confused the map of the territory and is is there is there sort of a is there an inescapable not maybe possibly relativism or postmodernism taken in that sort of very uh, crude and not very most accurate sense in terms of how it relates you know how it how it knows objects to the objects it constructs 
Yeah. I mean, I think cybernetics, there's absolutely an ethical dimension to the construction of the model that of a cybernetic system in that a cybernetic system is by assumption goal oriented it's oriented towards a particular goal which means you've already got some sort of sense of the system to be able to define what its goal is that it's oriented towards and this i mean this next to me of, of teleology and attractors and we can we can get into to some of that perhaps so paul silliers who is one of the co-authors of the second paper who's one of my absolute favorite philosophers and i absolutely i recommend folks check him out he has written extensively on the ethics of complex systems and of modeling one of his best papers in my opinion, is one that he co-authored with one of his students, Minka Warman. It's called The Ethics of Complexity and the Complexity of Ethics. It's It was published posthumously. And it's about the difficulties of modeling and how there's always a choice involved as to what singularities, what other things the system in question is put into relation to such that it defines how the system can transform. What are the, what is the matrix of possibilities that it can, that it can actualize through its transformations. And they build in that paper, a concept critiquing Kant's categorical imperative called the provisional imperative. And this is actually, I think, very related to Simondon and his ethical claims at the end of his individuation thesis, where he, he will lay out a sort of metastable ethics in which we make a choice when we model in that we are interested. So a model is defined by the variables that we're interested in, the various, which define the state space that, that a cybernetic system can, can move into, can, can actualize. And that means we're making a choice. There's a value judgment there as to what's interesting and what's not. And once you have that state space defined and you can map out the various ways that it can go, you can define attractors and you can define a goal, you can define the goal, but it's only knowable in hindsight or in, in a post hoc analysis of, of the system. And so if you don't choose those things, if you think about the system in relation to other things, it opens up new degrees of freedom that one particular model of the system may not allow you to think about. And so they argue that whenever you make a choice in how you model, whenever you whenever you define a system, you in order to, to model it and to try to predict what it's going to do, you have to take that as provisional. You have to understand that you are not totally mapping the system, that there's something outside of that that is beyond your model of it, your map of it, and is therefore inadequate. And so you have to be ready to revise and to take a really humble perspective on your own epistemology, your own understanding of, of the system in question. I find it really interesting that a lot of the, what we could call the problems of cybernetics, or at least the, the, the hurdles or the obstacles of constructing a cybernetic model, attend to the philosophical dimension of cybernetics has a very, and, and, and the way that it, it perceives its challenges have a very Nietzschean or Deleuzean di dimension. And, and there's two specific things that I'm thinking about. One is, like you're saying, the problem of fixity or provisionality, right? Insofar as we try to construct a totalizing system and create fixed goals, therein lies the problem in, in creating an adequate or at least a, a tentative model that that is usable because there's always going to be some kind of noise or something that exists outside the register of what is being measured cybernetically. At least this is one of the ways that I'm reading it because what the success of a cybernetic model depends upon is its ability to establish, as you said, the, the, the sort of identify what this, this at least provisional goal is like. And now let's create a set of measurement that, that we can reliably have data instantiate those forms of measure. Looking at this, the question of, well, how would anyone ever undermine a cybernetic mechanism? Well, there's one of two ways. You would have to disrupt 
its ability to take a measure of any given data, present your data to that mechanism as a kind of noise that somehow slips through the interstices of what it's able to identify or disrupt its sense of fixity or change its goal or rhythm. I, I'm curious if there's any sort of similar research or theses you know, around that idea of unsettling cybernetic machines. Absolutely. So Paul Silliers, in his analysis of complex systems, actually puts this, takes this as an ontological fundament, that there is a, a difference mm. or noise at the heart of any given system. And he'll do this, you can link this to cybernetics, he'll explicitly talk about this in his book, Complexity and Postmodernism. Which, is, right. which was his PhD thesis. And one way to illustrate this is actually using information theory. So mm. a, one of the founders of, or one of, one of the folks who really worked with the quantified theory of information, Shannon, Shannon's information theory, is a mathematical philosopher named Gregory Chaitin. And mm. he, with his algorithmic information theory, uh, tries to understand how much you can compress again an algorithm. And so let's say you take a string of, of letters, you can find a pattern in there and then sort of compress it down as much as possible. This is why also you could do, you know, if you're making a, if you're creating a zip file on your computer, this is a compression algorithm. But unless it's already dead simple, unless it's already a tautology, there's only so much that you can compress it without distorting it. Mm. So, and that is, what in information theory is called noise. Hmm. So there's only so much you can compress a given thing until you get noise at the heart of it. There's a, there's a fundamental incompressibility. He reconceptualizes noise as instead of something that's disruptive, which you know a goal-oriented system, a cybernetic system, will see something that is noise as distracting it from its goal. It makes it potentially makes it veer off course. But in this case, noise is actually what is constitutive, it undergirds the structure at its heart. So there's a, there's a fundamental incompressibility. And to tie this again back to Samandon, Samandon will draw upon an exact commander and the concept of the aperion or the undetermined, mm. which is the fundamental force, metaphysical force, that is the potential energy that is at the heart of a metastable system that is then structured through it being informed or being hit by an information signal to constitute a relation and produce an individual. So again, there's this fundamental incompressibility, this unde indetermined, this differencing difference, if you want to relate it to Deleuze's concept, fundamental concept here, difference. There's all of this all tied together here. And that noise actually so to speak, or the aperion or difference constitutes the identical or the, the self-similar thing. There, there's another way that I'm kind of thinking about it too. And, and actually, Simondon is, is part of it. And it's the idea of the crystal image that we see in Deleuze and Gattari's work. It's not an exact analog, no pun intended, to Simondon's notion of the crystal. But maybe a more basic concept in, in Deleuze's work is, is the form of the true versus the form of time, as the first one instantiates forms of judgment and time ins instantiates forms of creativity. It seems to me that cybernetics func functions almost strictly on forms of judgment. We're going to give you a set of binaries, yes or no, off or on. And to be able to slip them means to find some other register that stands outside the binarization of information. Maybe that maybe that's the the connection that I wanted to make. Adam, did you have something? I saw you had something. I have a question regarding sort of the legacy of cybernetics in terms of its popular reception, really. Because one of the things of at least in sort of our, our collective writings that we've sort of been bouncing around as well is the ideas that well, cybernetics really was had, it had its own kind of dream attached to it. In, I think, the 60s, there was this open memorandum called the Triple Revolution that was sent to Lyndon B. Johnson, and one of the revolutions they notified was the Cybernation Revolution, you know. The Cybernation, of course, for the listeners, being an old word for automation. And, of course, you had poems like All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. Of course, we had a cyberpunk. I mean, the, the image of cybernetics if anything, has significantly more power 
than the the, the field as, as a transdisciplinary academic practice. I mean, yeah, it's, cybernetics is, is it both sort of banal in terms of how minimal the abstract machines can be, sort of every day as a, as thermostats and kettles and the like, and yet. The cybernetic also carries with it an image of inherent future, you know, futuristy or futureness, and in in many ways, it seems like the the image of the cybernetic has sold more. It's, you know, it's outsold its actual its its actualization and to the extent to which, insofar as it's sort of under the image of capital or under capitalist forms of the image, as long as you can sell the image or the speculative image of the cybernetic, you don't actually need to generate any of the things that cybernetics was promising. You know, it's almost like instead of doing this Blade Runner thing where you can have all of these gadgets, or you can have like you know, the off-world colony, instead you've just automated the production of value to the extent that someone like Elon Musk can simply produce the image of a cybernetic future or a cybernetic actuality that's latent, and then sell that. So I guess to end it on sort of a you know, a bigger philosophical kind of question, or just a big philosophical. I mean, what do you think the the legacy of cybernetics is in the not only the philosophical imagination but also the popular imagination? And is there has there been kind of a a not so maybe possibly a catalyst corruption or just a inherent or maybe an inherent tendency of cybernetics itself to dissolve into these like very science fiction or cyberpunk images? Sure. So. Edward's book, The Closed World, which I referred to before, actually takes this up in the popular culture and does a an analysis of what he calls cybernetic discourse and how this plays out in popular culture. So he'll look at films, Terminator, Blade Runner, all these different things in there, and how the fear of the bomb and the closed world constituted by the image of the bomb, the discourse of the bomb, really affected us quite quite significantly in that dichotomy that was was developed between the United States and the liberal world order and the, the communist world, so to speak. And so that had, he will demonstrate in that text that it had made, it was majorly, it majorly affected popular culture. Furthermore, someone like Brian Masumi in his work, Auto Power, will go on to describe how after the fall of the USSR, and especially with the war on terror, ideas from cybernetics, and then especially complexity through the response to the war on terror, the fact that there's no longer a bipolar bipolarity, but really the hegemon, the liberal world order has become the established hegemony, and now is potentially being disrupted by terrorists, but unknowable, sort of unknowable, untraceable, unpredictable things that can affect it, can harm it. And will this unknowability is really taken to heart by the military apparatus of the United States and the, again, this sort of dominant liberal world order and continues to play out in popular culture and how we think about the war on terror or even software. I mean, Wendy Chun in her book, Program Visions, will talk about how software is the perfect metaphor because it at once claims to reveal everything, but also obfuscates everything or obfuscates many things and how this continues to play out in how we think about computers and software and information that is available to us, learning about ourselves, the limits of our own epistemic abilities so definitely it continues to pervade pervade popular culture absolutely and if you want to think about folks if you're listening you want to think about a, a book which arrives at the same time the crisis of cybernetics really hits its peak in terms of the unpredictability of of noticing uh, how certain enemy bodies or antagonistic bodies act on a global scale this was published more or less at the same time as 9-11, to Kuhn's The Cybernetic Hypothesis, just as a, a little foreshadowing for a potential future episode on, on cybernetics and its discontents there. <laughs> Nick, I just want to say thanks for coming on the show. Uh, it's been wonderful having you in the reading groups, and you've been a great interlocutor there and on Discord. Maybe before we go, um, you could say one or two books that people should be looking at on cybernetics that, or, or papers that are readily available, and we'll also pop them in the show notes. Sure. So I, I've obviously mentioned a few here in the course of our conversation. One that I 
read recently that I really liked on the history of computers and governmentality and, and cybernetic is actually focused on policing and the use of technologies, computer technologies by policing. And this is Brian Jefferson's Digitize and Punish. It's an excellent study of the role of computers and statistical analysis in and the adoption of those technologies by folks like NYPD or Chicago PD. And the geographic mapping of those territories and the production of criminality of Black folks, African Americans, and just a wonderful, wonderful study and critique of the way of what it's done and what policing has done to folks. And of course, Nick's own reading group on cybernetics. So of course, we we, we were doing our, our Mark Fisher group over on the cyberpunk. But if you want to get into some of the the scientific mathematical systems theory meat of the cybernetic sphere, which Mark Fisher has such a horrifying gothic fascination with, where can people find the group if they want to join? Sure. So we have a Discord server if folks are interested. I've shared it with the Acid Horizon folks who are participating in that Discord. And we don't really have an email address or anything if folks are interested, but I guess DM me on Twitter. Please please be nice. I, I don't <laughs> really have another way <laughs> to get a hold of me if you're interested, but maybe I'll I'll think of something in the Drop yeah, and and once we determine how to get access to you, I'll drop that in the show notes as well, so people can just navigate there. Yeah.